I'm Doug Bird. This is American Democracy, who's running the show, right? I just have a brief 15 minutes here. I'm going to talk about um, the state of the country and me. So I love political science. This is good stuff. Why am I talking here, right? Because this is what I do all the time. I even read this. This is what I was reading last night when I was going to bed, this beautiful story, Purify and Destroy the Political Uses of Massacre and Genocide. And my audience, they just loved it, which was my two children. They were a little disturbed by that book, actually. I'm not sure why, but the political uses of genocide drove Connor a little, he was a little disturbed. But OK, it's all right, though. This is good stuff. So my inspiration for this was a unpublished, but currently soon will be published, uh, article called Th Testing Theories of American Politics, Elites, Interest Groups, and Average Citizens. Uh, two authors, Martin Gillens and Ben Page. You might have seen them. They were on The Daily Show recently, right? And they did something remarkable. They tried to actually quantify, to actually prove or to test whether elites in this country, wealthy individuals, are more influential or your average citizens, right? And they did this by using polling data. And they looked at actual results. So let's talk about that a little bit. So they try to quantitatively answer the question, who's running the United States? Who's actually getting what they want? I mean, in a democracy, that's probably the most important question, right? We're talking about resources. Who's getting what they want and when, right? And we all might think, OK, yeah, we know rich people have more influence than the rest of us or something like that. But they can finally prove it. And they actually raise some serious questions that we'll talk about here about what democracy is in the United States. What does it look like, right? OK, so what they do is essentially they develop 1,779 cases. And they say, OK, here's a case where a policy changed or didn't change. And we're going to look at uh, what did the American people think? And then what did the top 1% and the top 10%, and this is looking at economic uh, values, what did they think, right? So we can now generate a set of actual, perhaps even causality, by saying, OK, here's what happened. 70% of the American people did not want to lower taxes on people making more than $100,000 a year. But the top 1% all wanted their taxes reduced. Well, what happened, right? And in this case, what they prove over, again, over almost 2,000 cases, is that when the preferences of economic elites and the stands of organized interests are controlled for, the preferences of the average American has only a minuscule or zero, or almost zero, uh, statistically insignificant impact on public policy. What that means essentially is that just because 50% of the American people plus one are in favor of something, basically that has no impact on whether that law will be changed or not changed. So just because a majority of Americans, that's over 150 million people, think something has almost no impact, in this case statistically an insignificant impact on whether a policy will be changed or adopted or something like that, right? So on one hand, we know that from these 2,000 cases that they've looked at, and they've run these regressions, that the American people's, uh, uh, their opinions basically doesn't matter, right? <laughs> that's, not, that's not the nicest story. But some people's opinion do matter. This is not just a random case. And what they're able to show, essentially, is that uh, organized elites, economic elites, representing business interests, have substantial independent impacts on US government policies while mass-based interest groups and average citizens have no impact. So the question is, so this was basically the whole part of their article. They don't get into why this is the case. They don't get into specifics of, OK, this group is more effective than this group, right? We know some of the ones that are really effective, right? The NRA, the AARP, you don't mess with senior citizens. There's only one reason why you do that. It's not because they're super strong or anything. They're pretty slow, mostly. Um, but because they vote. <laughs> they vote. That's what they do, right? OK, and they have a lot of money in terms of that resource. Well, the question is, why is that so? And they ultimately say that the United States is a plutocracy. I don't know. There's a lot of weird stuff on the internet. Plo Pluto people, did you know this? There's like a movement of people that are against Pluto not being considered a planet. I just thought I'd mention that, even though it has nothing to do with this lecture. All right, so a plutocracy is a system where the wealthy have political control over the system, right? Or the rich, this is different than an aristocracy or a monarchy or whatever, but it's basically business rich people have control over the political power in the system. And their, their theory and what they develop, the data that they actually have, suggests that that's the type of system we have in the United States. So not a democracy, right? Democracy being ruled by the people, but a plutocracy. Okay, so why? And some of this is very straightforward. But why does the political system we have, a 
according to their data, which is, which is uh, again, going to be published in the fall in one of the top political science journals, and even got them onto the John Stewart, so political scientists aren't generally listened to at all. Um, we've only had one president that was a political scientist. Anybody know who that was? Anyone guesses? Woodrow Wilson? Yes. Okay. But, you know, he formed the League of Nations and all that stuff, but had a stroke. Okay. So, the question is why? Why is it that the top 1% have a statistically more significant impact on whether something will change or not change than the whole of American opinion, right? 50, 60%. Well, there are a variety of reasons. One is, think about it, who is in Washington, D.C. lobbying and asking for policy changes? There's no advocate for the people. The advocate for the people should be Congress, our representatives. But we're talking about who lobbies Congress, right? Well, who is actually there? Who's in D.C. lobbying? Well, business interests, basically the wealthiest sectors of American society, right? They're the people who are actually there. Common citizens do not have groups like this. We do see citizen movements and groups coming up. I mean, even something like the Occupy Wall Street, the Tea Party, these were citizen groups, at least initially, right? But they don't last very long, and they have, it's hard for them to overall impact. They don't have the money that these other things do. Remember, Congress is a revolving door. Almost half of Congress people who leave end up becoming lobbyists. So what you're seeing is basically a circle here, right? So not only do they have lobbyists in Washington, D.C. that are important, right? And they're actually there asking for things and demanding things. But many of the lobbyists, the most effective lobbyists, are former Congress people themselves. So they're able to really get into that system. And believe me, if you're in Congress and somebody offers you two or three million dollars a year to work, what, a couple months a year at most to be a lobbyist, that's a good deal. I'm signing up for that in a second, <laughs> right? All you have to do is call people you already know. You just call them up on the phone. Hey, Bill, you know, we heard about this case. I'm working for McDonald's here, and I don't want you to put some kind of law about chicken nuggets having to look a specific way or taste the way or, you know, be healthy or something crazy like that. Okay, so there's a stranglehold on the American political system that comes from the lobbyist system in the United States. The lobbyists are affecting policies. And the question is, who are the lobbyists? Where are they coming from? Well, they're coming from the elites. And that's logical, isn't it? We wouldn't assume, for example, that homeless Americans would have a strong lobbying interest, or, or I should say interest group, right? They, they just don't have the resources to get together and pay people to go to Washington, D.C. and ask for things. Okay, so we have a systemic uh, built-in advantage for wealthy people in the United States to get their voice just simply heard. Now, whether they act on that is a different question, isn't it? But in the article, they actually found that the top 1% is 15 times more likely to get a policy decision made than the majority of the country, right? Because the majority of the country is not wealthy, obviously. Okay, so that's very significant. But the other question is, the other part of this is uh, money. So there's the Citizens United decision, right? Money flowing over the political parties. It's money. Money is the other part. We all know that money can't buy you love. I'm not sure that hasn't been tested. But anyways, I've been married for almost 15 years. I assure you my wife did not marry me for money. I haven't figured out why. may have just been a random bad decision. But uh, anyways. So money. In 2012, President Obama attended over 250 fundraisers in a single year, more than doubling the record set by his predecessor, George W. Bush. Right. That's a lot of fundraisers when you're attending almost one a year, okay? So the money is obviously super important to him for his re-election campaign. Mitt Romney attended a lot as well, and he didn't have to be president at the same time, so he had more time, right? Okay, six billion dollars was spent on the 2012 election. Six billion dollars, that's a lot of money, right? This money is essential to being re-elected in the United States. If you don't have the resources, Either you'll be heard in the primary or you'll be heard in the general election, right? You need that money. If you want to look at who's going to retire in, in D.C., they're always trying to forecast what senator or what congressman is going to retire. All you have to look at is who's raising money. The people that quit raising money, they're going to retire, right? Because think about it. If you think you're probably likely to retire from your job, that's going to be one of the first things you stop doing. Probably in PCC like a committee assignment. If you know you're going to retire within a few years, you're just going to stop showing up for that committee regularly. And by the way, on the committees that I haven't been showing up to, it's not because I'm retiring soon. Pretty sure I, I can't. Anyway, I, okay. 
So $6 billion was spent on a 2012 election. This means that who has money is going to have an enormous impact on who's going to get hurt. I don't buy it for a second that these people are going to give millions of dollars to a representative and not get some kind of influence. It doesn't even make any sense. It's not logical. No one operates that way. Somebody gave you $5,000 tomorrow, and then they called you up a month from now and said, hey, I just want to talk to you about an issue. What kind of person would you be if you said, forget about it. I don't have time for you, right? OK, especially if you're thinking they're going to give you more money in the future, right? OK, so this is extremely important. And Supreme Court decisions, we've heard about this. McCutcheon was the most recent case, and then we also had Citizens United, right? So the Supreme Court itself has performed uh, an interesting addition to this by being a barrier to any change, right? So they're actually opening up the system to more money, essentially. But don't worry, there's already unlimited money in the system as it is. So it's like they're really making things that worse. But they are, a little bit. Okay, so the question is, I think ultimately, and again, the, the article doesn't get into this, but it's worth thinking about. So who cares, right? So we know that the wealthy elites in this country have an enormous amount of influence on public policy, that your average American, in this case, has a specific, statistically insignificant impact, right? So wealthy and educated people have a lot of things that your average American might not have, right? They know things. They understand how to invest, right? I mean, they understand running businesses and other things like that. They're more educated on average than your average citizen, right? So maybe that's not the worst thing. Maybe we do want some sort of platonic uh, aristocracy running the country. Well, I think the problem with that is it's true that the elites in this country do know some things. Perhaps they have a, an advantage on certain elements. But what do they know about other policies? If these are the people making decisions in the United States, or at least impacting decisions, right, what do they know about welfare policies? What do they know about average tax burden to the, somebody in the middle class or the lower class? What do they understand about the environmental impact when we look at environmental policies, the people that are generally impacted are low-income people who cannot afford to get out of areas that are dangerous, right? That are living in the bad school districts, right? What do they know about these things? They don't know about these things, right? Unless if they grew up poor or something like that. But anyways, their knowledge is limited, right? So when we're seeing public policies being made that are looking like they're favoring wealthy Americans, we shouldn't be surprised by that simply because the politicians are making decisions, in this case, clearly based off of the elite interests in the country, specifically uh, the influence of the top 1%. And I think that today, when we talk about, some of you have watched the viral video about wealth inequality in the United States, where all the money's floating around, right? And we see that absurd amount of money, almost half of the wealth in the country is in the top 1%, right? Last presidential election, there was a lot of talk about this. That wealth inequality gap in the United States that seems to keep growing and growing and growing, well, that, I think, relates to this. Right? Why we're getting a system that continues to allow for increased, for example, if you're looking at capital gains taxes, right? Why did uh, Warren Buffett, supposedly his story was what? He's paying less taxes than his secretary. Well, if we try to explain that as a percentage, we're going to understand it through this, right? Okay. The First Amendment is a barrier, and that's what the court's dealing with. So if we want to fix this kind of stuff, I am unfortunately going to end by saying that we'd have to amend the Constitution probably and we're not going to be amending the Constitution anytime soon. Last real amendment was changing the voting age to 18, and that happened during the Vietnam War, basically. So anyways, I'm not, not that I'm a pessimist. I'm actually not. Okay, so I'll conclude there. All right, thank you very much. Um,